We're at about 1.5 million, eight employees. Goals for 2 million this year. We actually just have an ad out now. It's $65,000 job. I'm just looking for a rock star. Yeah, I believe this office manager will get us over the $2 million mark this year. Because I'm getting so sucked into the everyday crap that I can't really grow the company if I'm answering the cell phone, dealing with the problems that I don't have to deal with. What is up, guys? Today I'm here with Jake, the owner of Benjamin's Pro Power Washing out in Massachusetts. So Jake, before we dive into it, just to kind of establish who you are and why people should listen to you, do you mind just sharing what businesses you're a part of, what the revenue and you know volume of team members looks like and kind of just break that down for us? So uh, what's up, everybody? Uh, I'm Jake Benjamin here in Boston, Mass. We're at about 1.5 million, eight employees, been in business since 2019 uh, with goals for 2 million this year. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. For sure. And I know the goal for this year is, uh, your last year you guys did 1.5 million, if that's correct. And your goal for this year is 2 million? 2 million, yeah. Awesome. Um, so what, what we are is press, pressure washing, gutter cleaning, uh, roof cleaning, paver sealing, and Christmas light installation. So those those make up you know the percents of the company. We just got into Christmas lights though. Did pretty much our first full year this year. We did just under 200 in Christmas lights. So Nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that alone should help push you towards that two mil mark for next year. Absolutely. I think um, if you want to, I think that's the like the pretty scalable company. Like you should be able to your first couple of years, you should be able to double if you if you want to just you, you have all these clientele lists. So like we have, I think, 3097 customers for pressure washing. So when we started that and you do an email blast, that's a free 3000 whatever customers potential chance of getting, you know, so that mm -hmm. our first year was really not much advertising, under a couple grand for sure. Wow. Yeah, just leveraging your current database. I mean, a absolutely, yeah. Essentially, no cost for acquisition. You can just squeeze the juice out of the leads you already have. Exactly, for the most part. For sure. Well, nice. So um, I know you guys do a lot of commercial work as well. Do you mind kind of breaking down the percentage of revenue from commercial work compared to residential? We're about 60, 40, 60 residential, 40 commercial. Uh, if you go to the Instagram or Facebook, it, it, it's kind of deceiving because everything we post is really commercial. And the reason why is that's how we want to be known is commercial pressure washing. So mm -hmm. that that's the reason why I do that. And it seems to work well. You know, we do a lot of college campuses, you know, uh, Harvard, Boston, huge. We do a bunch of work at Tufts University. Um, the big place we do at Endicott College, Merrimack College, Endicott College. We do a lot of colleges and, you know, you get in with them, you know, uh, you're, you're pretty good. Yeah. I was going to say um, on your website, you had some very impressive uh, clients that you've worked with, like Boston College, Harvard, all that. So I guess my question is, how did you kind of establish those relationships and get your foot in the door with those type of organizations? You know, a few of them would, were from, I believe, like PPC. And then some of them were just through high-end clients. You know, say we did somebody's pavers, house roof for $15,000. You know, they would know somebody that knew somebody. And we were first sub outs from like, let's say a landscape company. And then eventually the college was like, hey, Jake, you know, you know, we love your work. We don't want to step over toes here, but, you know, we can't be going through three different people to get to you, you know? So I, I had to make a few phone calls and, you know, explain to the people that got me in there, Hey, you know, I'll give you a kickback or, or something, but we just got to go direct. Uh, so you never want to cut out the middleman. You always want to, you know, never forget where you started, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Don't burn your bridges. Yeah. Don't, don't do that because they got you in there and I'm, probably sure they could probably get you out of there too. <laughs> so yeah, like, so the landscape company again, um, so say we did paver cleaning and sanding and it was a $10,000 job, you know, either a cut them a piece of it or B have them come in and do the sanding, like keep them involved in the, in the project as well. Uh, mm -hmm. just makes the world go around. Yeah, absolutely. And then they can always refer work to you as well. So Exactly. If you don't mind me sharing, what's like the biggest contract you currently have um, on the commercial side of things? Oof. Probably Tufts University. I, I don't like a anybody being, you know, like 10% of your revenue. I think that's that's scary. If I got that opportunity, I'd probably take it. But I don't go out there digging for those big, big ones like that because, you know, they're price shopping a lot of the times. Every year or two, they're just going to bring in a couple more bids just to, just to make sure you're, you know, in line and for me i don't know that's just I, I don't like it 
I would say Tufts. And then we do a lot of work with this company called Air Gas. For example, we do de-icing. It's in the winter. And we're out today, actually. We're on the, so we're here in Massachusetts and we're on the New Hampshire, uh, New York border. Uh, and working in Connecticut, de-icing today to send a truck up there. I mean, we have three days of work and it's going to be about $15,000. And, and that's I just paying one labor. Going out? Just two people. Two people. Wow. So it's like we're getting four to five grand every vaporizer we de-ice, but they pay travel time. And, you know, we're getting $395 an hour, no matter what. As soon as we leave the shop, the truck breaks down. That's that's not, that's just part of it. It's the nature of the beast. Um, we'll, we'll travel anywhere, really. In Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Rhode Island. So, yeah, they're, they're a big part. I think over 100K for them. And how but, much was it for um for the college? Is like, I think like just under 180. Oh, wow. Okay. So that is like a, a yeah, little. Yeah, that is a big one. That's why I mean it's scary, you know? Yeah. But uh, I, I think that just forces you to go yeah, once, yeah, between those two, it's, it's a quarter million. Wow. So between just two contracts, you're doing a quarter million from that alone. Yeah, yeah. That's why uh, I get nervous, you know? They're both kind of newer clients, I would say in the past year or so, two, year and a half. We had them all last year and then like half of the other year or so. Yeah, that can definitely be worrisome because if just one leaves, that's 10% of your revenue. But um, oh, yeah. yeah, like just I was like saying, that. if you can if you can just shift your mindset and say, well, hey, let's get to $2 million. Now that's less than 10% of my revenue. Exactly. That's what it is. I mean, I I'm great with these people. These people that we're talking about, when they call me, we're there usually within 24 hours. You know, somebody like them, we, we make it work. I'll push trucks off. I'm, we make stuff happen to get to those people because I think that's a huge reason why we have that great relationship, you know, mm -hmm. uh, just, just being able to get the job done and get it done early and get it done fast. That's what they want. So yeah. let's say, um, someone is either a newer business or someone that just been mostly doing residential, but they want to start getting some more commercial work. What are some steps they can take to start moving in that direction? I think a great like in on commercial is HOAs. I think they're the easiest to get. And it's a great foot in the door and it's good for the problem is when you start out, cause I remember everyone would be like, Oh, who have you done work for? You know, like a big place, like say you're working for Coca-Cola or Pepsi, you haven't done it for anybody. So mm -hmm. it's like an HOA is nice. Cause you know, they have a bunch of properties, even if it's, I mean, I think an HOA is a good step in the door and easy to get. Just type in on your Google property management companies near me. Send everyone emails, send them 50, send them a box of Joe and Dunkin' Donuts. Introduce yourself. Uh, I think that's a great first step. If I were to tell somebody to do that, you know, I mean, you can get in with a Chick-fil-A, Dunkin' Donuts, do dumpster pads. Just, just get the big names on your back before you start hopping at these big ones. I think, I think that's something I would, I could go back and tell myself that's, that's what I would do. Well, okay. I'll so, think of these big, big, huge jobs. You know, we pop up on all these, you know, Facebook sites now, and you see these massive places, and you know, people are pressure washing them. Well, we all want that, but realistically, you know, don't bite off more than you can chew. Right. So in the beginning, go for those smaller projects and play more so of a a volume game. Yeah, yeah. I would say that's good wordage for sure. Yeah, just get your foot in the door. You know, and it knock ask don't be afraid to ask you know you, what's the worst that's going to happen they're going to say no so then they at least have your name and your contact info you know and always collect emails because that way you can put them in you know when you're doing your your email blast they're in the blast so you're just kind of keeping that name in front of their face so the day ever comes you know they remember you easily for sure not to steer off topic here, but we got to about 800K without a CRM. I used to handwrite everything. Like, I'm not joking. That was mind blowing. Now, you know, you get these CRMs with these automated, like, I'm so bad with technology. Like, it's just terrible. And so for me to like, I remember that I didn't start Zooming until I joined this business group called Conquer. I didn't even know what a Zoom was. How, how funny is that? You know, uh, hilarious. you're just doing it through like your personal phone. Yeah, literally. Yeah, that's crazy. Like if like somebody like if I had out. like a somebody come into my house and I had this big calendar with everything on it, if somebody burnt that my business was done, you know, like that's that was I don't even know how to explain that. But um, so I guess that what that is, it's for, it's for the people. You don't need all these fancy things to start, you know. When you're starting and you're under 300K, like you don't need to get all these business coaches and all these CRMs and you don't need all this stuff. 
Does it help? Of course. Yeah. You should, I'm not saying don't track your KPIs, but don't, don't go into, a, I need to get everything or, oh my God, this is overwhelming because I ran three trucks with nothing. Yeah. What you're describing is like people getting analysis paralysis because they think they need all these things in place before they actually take action. But what you did was a reverse. And honestly, your business is probably your business at that point doing uh, 800K per year, probably way larger than a lot of guys that are using all this technology and CRMs and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, I can't say I get frustrated. Our industry is very unique. I call it unique to people, like a little niche. You know, you have all these things where it's like, yeah, you know what? You need operations managers, you need office staff, you need office assistants, you need sales. You need all these things, but when you hit a certain level, you get, you get everyone now. It's like, oh no, like you got to get out of the truck, get out of the truck, get out of the truck. No, it's like, I believe that you stay in the truck for a bit, get, get your name out there, make sure the works, you know, what it's supposed to be, know everything, you know, in the field, be, you know, be the expert and maybe hire an office, someone, an office manager where you're out working for a bit. I mean, I think that's super important. Like I'm so knowledgeable in the field, like any truck can call me and I just know how to fix the problem without even being there, you know, because I was in the field, because I did all that stuff. So that was important. Uh, I got out of the truck about two years ago. And so I'm, I'm the operations manager. I'm the sales. And, and I, run, I actually still answer this, uh, the company phone today. Our big, my big goal this year is a full-time office manager. We actually just have an ad out now. It's $65,000 job. And I'm just looking for a rock star. And I, I believe this, this office manager uh, will get us over the $2 million mark this year alone. Cause I'm getting so sucked into the everyday crap that, you mm -hmm. know, I can't really grow the company if I'm answering a cell phone, dealing with the problems that I don't have to deal with. Yeah. A lot of people probably hear that and think that's crazy. You're going to offer someone $65,000 to do something you can already do yourself. But in reality, by doing so, it's going to generate you that much more money because now you've bought back your time. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, that that's sixty five thousand dollars. Like this person is going to run my QuickBooks. Right. So like I pay my CPA and I believe last year we paid ten thousand dollars. So it's like th that's sixty five thousand. A lot of that money that I'm dishing out right now, she'll be able to take that stuff over. You know, it's just going to save me so, so much, so much. You know, I can take the new guys. And, and train them in the field. You know, I can do all these things now. It's going to just really open it up for me. Take a yeah. lot of stress off my plate too. I actually was making notes the other day and the notes were um, the everyday like job list. Like, you know, I wanted to put a hat on what I was doing every single day. And it actually blew my mind because my hat was on like everything but two things. And I was like, wow, you know, I'm, I didn't realize like how involved I am in this company. That's going to change this year. For sure. And that's actually interesting that you kind of compose that list when doing that. Then when doing so, did you notice like certain areas where it's like, why is your time even going towards that? Like, oh, I for sure. For sure. Far, like, yeah, like far answering less. phones and emails. One. Why, why am I answering the cell phone? There's no need. If it's, you know, a big job or something, of course. Yeah. I'll call them back. Hey, if it's commercial, let me know at the end of the day, I'll call them. But you get so sidetracked and you know, some of the phone calls, you know, they're just crap. You know, mm -hmm. you can wash my car. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, no, we can't wash a car. But just that, you know, invoicing as far as fixing machines, like oil change, filter changing. Like I shouldn't be worrying about that stuff. You know, that's that's just something I shouldn't be worrying about. Um, like shop management, like who's the who's who's in charge of, you know, the shop here and the products that are getting ordered. What, what, what broke for the day, you know, end of day sheets. Those are super important, but just, just all these little tasks that just accumulate to a full days of work, you know, that's a good approach. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people aren't doing any time audits. They don't even really think twice about where their time is going, but if you were to literally write down everything you're doing throughout the day, you're probably going to notice most, a lot of your time is going towards stuff that you can outsource for far less what your time is worth and then buy back a ton of your time. And then you can put that towards activities that will grow the business more. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I watched this podcast. It was Rob Deerdeck, I believe, and Ed Milet. It was a great one. It was about buying back time. Rob mm -hmm. Deerdeck was huge on. So every hour, he would take a little, little notepad and write down what he did that hour. He would do it every day because a lot of us, you know, like say you go home and the girlfriend or the wife, hey, what'd you do today? 
oh, you know, I didn't email this, this. But it's like, what did you actually do is the question. Like, what did you do? What did you accomplish? What got done? What didn't get done? You know, I think a lot of the times we're just kicking a can down the road for the day and just getting by saying we did it. So, you know, keeping track of your time and what you're doing, what you're not doing is just super important because like you just said, you know, you get wrapped up and you don't even know where your day goes. You go home and you just say, man, I was busy today, but busy and productive is different for sure. Yeah. I used to catch myself doing that all the time where I would go about my day at the end of it. I'd think back and say, what did I accomplish today? And, you know, I couldn't think of anything, but right. doing something like you mentioned, a time audit where you're literally breaking it down throughout the, the entire day. One, you know where your go time is going and two, you know where it should not be going and you can start eliminating eliminating those things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's being, being honest with yourself too. Like, what did you really do? Like, if you flip through Facebook for 20 minutes, that's fine, you know? But at the end of the day, when you add up all that Facebook time or Instagram or whatever all this stuff is, uh, I think you'll be a little disappointed in yourself. Yeah. Well, um, cool. I want to shift gears a little bit. I know you're still in the sales, so I would like to get your uh, get your approach when it comes to kind of commercial projects. Like when you get your foot in the door with someone, not necessarily a script, but kind of like what is your approach? What are you saying to them? What are you pitching them um, in regards to your business and yourself? Yeah. So I think we chat on this a little bit uh, the first time. And this is my little hack and it doesn't always work. It depends on the relationship you have with somebody. But uh, when we're in there, I mean, I'm always, always looking for more. Like, for example, when I get into a job and we're cleaning, let's say, in front of a building, granite steps, I'm already walking around that property looking at a million other projects. And I would snap a photo right in the bottom of it. You just we would write um, the price of all these other jobs and send it when we're done. They don't, mo most people don't really know what's dirty because this is our job. We're professionals. You know, we know what needs to be clean, but most people don't. So when you bring it to attention, they're like, Oh my God, that is dirty. That is clean. So like that, that's something. And another thing to know is when you're going into these projects, there's usually a cap and the cap means that, you know, say you reach $10,000. Well, now that job has to go out to bid. That's just how it works. That's just what it is. So I would always try to break down one job into two or three. So again, I'll go back to um, pressure washing pavers, sanding and sealing. Say the job came to 18,000 bucks. And I'm like, dang, this job's going to go out to bid. I'm going to bid this in two ways, or I'm going to bid this in three. I'm going to bid this with cleaning the pavers, sanding the pavers and sealing the pavers at six grand a piece and send in three quotes. Technically it's under 10 grand, right? I mean, you combine them all together, but they're all separate. Technically it's a two, three day job. So stuff like the little stuff of thinking outside the box, I think is super important, but that's just something we, we do here. I do, but yeah, I'd say that that's a big one. That's something to think about. Just always thinking outside the box and that's worked for us so many times. I can't, I can't even count how many times I actually, a lot of people like it too. It's a price breakdown, you know, mm -hmm. um, see if it even fits in their budget. Yeah. But by breaking it down, so it is less than 10,000, what you're saying is um, because it's less than 10,000, most organizations don't even need to go get other bids. They'll just probably go with you. But if it's above 10,000, it's much more likely they do need to go get those other bids. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's just how it works. I mean, you know, I mean, it's think about you trying to get housework done at your house. You call all these contractors and no one comes, no one answers or no one sends you an estimate. When you get an estimate and it seems fair, it's I'm just like, get it done. You know, like so that's how a lot of people are. You know, they want you to show up, send over the estimate, send your insurance forms, you know, whatever. Maybe send some other jobs that you've done before and afters, et cetera. I guarantee they'll pick you. You know, if it's under, I think a lot of people aren't confident in themselves when they send these bids, mm -hmm. you know, you see them all jump on the Facebook forms, like how much for this? And, you know, you'll see prices from 2000 to 50. And it's just like, where are people coming up with these numbers? I think yeah. a lot of people just need to be more confident. Yeah. I'm sure that's a huge thing because some people will underbid themselves like crazy just to win the bid. Um, but then like, they're probably hurting their business by doing so. And if they don't, since they don't have the budget, if they don't go out there and do an amazing job, like they're not going to get that work again yeah another thing in the industry too is like we're expensive out here i mean we have we have a close ratio of like 47 percent on jobs i actually don't think we're expensive i think that a lot of these people are just too cheap and and they're really screwing their employees and, and their business 
that's what they're doing. They're getting the job, but that's all they're doing. So they're helping the client, but they're not helping their team. I'm the opposite here. You know, you go on our sites. We always have the best clothing. You know, we have the best trucks. We have the best equipment. We have the, it's, and I give back to the guys and we have the high, I have the highest paid technicians guaranteed. You know, I got, I got a kid that just made just under hundred K this year. You know, the, we have people making $32, $28, you know, the point they deserve it. You know, they're out there and, you know, you got to give back to them and we're getting ready to do full-time health insurance. And, you know, all these people that are underbidding, you're just really screwing your employees and yourself. That's all you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Cause that job, you won't take that job next year at that price. And, and now you just made that standard. Like now we're all, everyone thinks that that job's X amount of money. And that's not true. Yeah, that's true. A lot of people will basically create a price anchor by saying, hey, I'll only do it for 300 this time, even though it's worth 500 Next year, you try to go up in pricing, they're either going to go with another exactly. company. Exactly. It's too difficult. Yeah, exactly. Like with Christmas lights, you see that with Christmas lights, you hear about it, I'm sure. I mean, you see people bid. We get a company out here, you know, we're eight to, we're eight to 10 bucks a foot. We have companies at $4. It's like, what are you doing? And then you see them like, oh, we hung 100 customers yeah but you're about to hang your business too hang it up because you're about to be out of business and and it's 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 not it's not about how much but it's just i don't know i don't really know how to explain that one but i just don't understand people's logics behind what they do and we're in this for the long haul yeah exactly so like you can't hurt your business by increasing your prices but you can hurt it by lowering them I've never seen a business get hurt by increasing their prices no i, I mean we did a small increase this year i think we did eight to ten percent this year uh, that's just what it is. Yeah. And I mean, you know, your numbers, I don't know if it affected your closer at all, but if it did, like it probably still, you probably made more revenue and higher profit margins as a result of just having, having the higher prices regardless. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's funny, you know, we'll have clients when I started in 19, they'll reach out and this, like we just had some lady and she, we went up 200% almost on her and she had like a stroke, but it was just like, we first started out. I didn't know pricing. I didn't know business. She got a killer deal. And uh, they still come with us, you know, they're all, they're all on board, but it's just explaining to them. Like, you know, I, you know, we have all these bills, you know, I have a big shop here. We have 5,500 square feet. You know, I have an office, we have a little uh, office gym. We have um, a coffee and break room. You know, I have all these big bills to pay all these, you can't work for free. You know, you just can't do it. It doesn't work. And that's awesome. It's funny you say that, um, I was just at a, a local pressure washing business doing about like 2 million per year yesterday. And I was kind of looking over wow. their office and it's interesting because like the littlest things you don't think about that affect the, um, the employee just satisfaction. Like the fact like that there's, and they actually enjoy showing up to work. Like you, the fact that you have a gym is awesome. Like, yeah, I can't think of a single other uh, business like in this similar business model that does something like that for their employees. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's huge for, you know, myself and, and the guys, you know, I mean, health, health is wealth, you know, with, without health, we get nothing. So, yeah. and, and just being able to offer something like that, you know, save, save them what 40, 50 bucks a month instead of going to a gym. I mean, we have a bench weights, pull up machines. Uh, like I'll have to send you a thing after. Yeah. But that's it's nice. And, it's just for the guys, you know, same, same with the little stuff, like the fridge and the coffee and the snacks and the food. Like this year, uh, everything is, you know, protein chips and, and protein bars and, you know, good stuff for the guys. Uh, I just think stuff like that's huge. I never had that growing up. I never had that when I worked for companies, you know, so being able to offer that is, is just, it's awesome. It's a if little thing. If there's any one factor that I've noticed with all the business owners I've been interviewing recently, it's that they care so much about their employees. They're not doing anything massive to impact employees, but they're doing so many little things that impacts them in a big way. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I always tell the guys when, you know, when I first started this, it was about me and uh, that goes right out the window when you get your first employee, you know, it, it's about we. So uh, it's, a, it's a team thing. Yeah. You know? we, we win together, we lose together. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because a lot of people do get in the business because they want to be their own boss and like have their own thing, but it's not their own thing. If they're going to create a real business, it's going to be the group's thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The goal is essentially to allow it to outgrow yourself and be bigger than you. Yeah. I mean, I think that it'd be selfish of us not to build something that 
you know, scale, scale it to something that's sellable and, you know, give everyone a piece of the skin when you're done without the guys, we wouldn't, I wouldn't be here today. And without me, they wouldn't be here. So uh, it's a two way street here for sure. Well, cool. I know we have, um, no, we have a decent amount of time. Something I did want to kind of wrap up with was the whole commercial side of things. I want to do a little exercise. Let's say I'm a, like I said, the situation earlier, trying to get into commercial work, have no no reviews, no previous ex previous commercial experience to show for, what can I include in my pitch when I'm talking to, let's just say it's a small gas station, like even just a small company like that. Um, but what can I say in my pitch to help kind of move the needle and increase my odds of actually closing the deal? Ex explain that a little more here. What do you mean? I don't, I can't say, you know, I've done this work for Duncan or Chick-fil-A. I can't show them work I've done in the past what can I say that might still allow them to decide to go with me as opposed to another more established company? Yeah. I mean, free demos are killer for sure. Whatever it is you're trying to clean there. I mean, Hey, do you mind if I clean a section of this for you for free? Um, just, just ask. I mean, that, that right there will show them, Hey, there's the results, you know, results don't lie. So I, I would do a free demo. I've done it a few times. That That's probably what I would I mean, on the top of my head, just with the gun to it right now, that's that's what I would say. I'd go with the free demo. Yeah, and that's a really good strategy. Like if they play the volume game, they go to 100 small businesses, offer a demo. Let's say they have a bad close rate. They only close 10 deals. I mean, it probably took them a few days to acquire 10 deals. That's massive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's what I would do. It's hard, you know, it's really hard sometimes because I didn't have, when I got into business, I mean, obviously I didn't have money. I mean, I, I used to be in the union in Boston and I started my business with a three gallon a minute roll around machine on the weekends, but I never had to door knock. I never had to do a lot of these things we're talking about. You know, I, I was very, I was always very pricey. I've always had the, the money. And if I didn't get a lead or I didn't get a job or say somebody wanted a quote, I would just move on and leave them because I was always so busy. So I was always fortunate enough to never really have that, that struggle. So I, I wish I could give more in that, but I just, I, I really can't. Okay. And I mean, to your point as well, it seems like you did have that very fast growth. I mean, you've been doing it for five years. That's not an overnight success. It took a while, but there's a lot of people that take multiple decades to get to where you are now. If there's any one thing, what would you attribute your fast growth to? Uh, whew, that's a good one. You know, I always tell everybody the number, the number one thing is answering your phone communication my communication was always just on point no one could touch it i would answer my phone didn't matter when 1 a.m 5 a.m 7 a.m midnight i would answer my phone and i'd get them scheduled or i'd answer my phone and get them on the books to go look at the job and just the communication is just everything i mean picture trying to get a hold of somebody and you just can't you can't it's frustrating but you want to use them you know Mm -hmm. So that right there, communication was just everything. And just, you know, being a man of my word, you know, uh, I would book them always out a week, two weeks, and we would be there when I said we would be there. And that was huge. So I'd say that probably. Yeah, that's a really good point and a really simple one that anyone can literally change right away. Like if you're not answering your phone every single time it rings, then you just start answering it and you're going to see the more you throw money, money away. I think my father said it. If he saw this, he would laugh. I think my father said it and it stuck with me. He says, Jake, when someone's calling you, they want to give you money. And I was just, it was just a weird perspective that stuck in my head. And it, and it's true. Think about it. It's true. Someone's calling you. They want your service. They're technically trying to give you money. So you just throwing it away. So that, that was something that, that was huge for me. And I've always been good at it. I'm always on my phone. It's, it's a pro and con. It's a vicious thing, you know? Yeah. You want that free time, but it's like, I'm at the gym. Someone calls, it's not a good thing, but I'll stop, answer it. It's mm -hmm. just who I am. I'm getting better though. This year, this past six months, I've been, I've been getting much better. I can actually push a phone call aside or, or say, Hey, do you mind if I call you back in 45 minutes? You know, but yeah, it took me, it took me about five years. But uh, once you get the office manager, I mean, you're going to be answering every single call and it's not going to take up any of your time at that point. Yeah. So we actually have this. Uh, voiceover system, a uh, dial pad now. So it rings to the office for about 15 minutes, uh, 15 seconds. If they don't, it boots over to my, it boots over to my personal. And then I can decide, Hey, if I want to answer this or not. Mm -hmm. you know? and then yeah. if not, what I love about dial pad is they'll leave a voicemail. 
and the voicemail goes to my email and it, it will read it as a text message to me so I can see if it's important or not. So something like that was pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And so even on a smaller scale for the guy that's still, you know, he's on the truck, he's still doing the jobs and he's saying, well, hey, I don't have the um, liberty of answering every single phone call. What would you say at that point they can do? Like, let's say they have some budget where they could potentially um, implement some type of system or person. What should they do? I want to say that again. You, you, it kind of bugged in and out on me. Sorry. Yeah, no, like, um, let's just say someone is still working the truck. They're still going out doing the work every day and they don't have the liberty of answering their phone every time it rings. Do you have any suggestions for what they could potentially do in that case? So then someone can answer or some some type of system to help kind of still nurture that that person that's calling in? I'm pretty sure like your phone can do like automated, like you can send them like a, something automated, right? On phone can call back and th like you can do, I I'm not sure. But I believe you can set something up on your iPhone or your cell phone you know, to, to give them an automated response, like a text back. Um, yeah. A text back or, mm -hmm. you know, direct them in your voicemail to, to your website, you know, Hey, you know, couldn't get to the phone. You know, if you go to the website, uh, Benjamin power washing and fill out the free estimate form, we'll get back to you ASAP, something, something to try to catch them. Um, that's what I would do. I mean, you can hire these VAs now. I, we personally, I don't, but you can, I heard you can hire people for like, pennies really like three or five bucks an hour is that true yeah yeah that's what i was um i was actually hoping you were going to say that i didn't know if you had experience in doing that or not but um yeah well that's what we'll often recommend is if you get someone four dollars an hour have them available eight hours a day like it's really not costing you that much money um but you're going to be able to answer every single call that comes your way so if your excuse is like you know i'm out on the truck it only costs you a few dollars a day to be able to answer all of those calls but even just what you said about the voicemail, I mean, that's a huge point because there's so many guys that have a terrible voicemail and are scaring people away because of that alone. <laughs> yeah. Or or the worst is because I've caught myself before. <laughs> a couple of years ago, I had this company and they were able to listen to my phone calls after I hung up. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, with, I think, lead connector and I would be out in the field and I'd be, you know, working. It was hot. I was tired. So I'd answer the phone. I didn't realize how grouchy I sounded and rushy on the phone because I was so sidetracked and just trying to get these jobs done. You know, I'd answer the phone like, hello, you know, but it would just be very fast. I would try to push them off the phone or so that's not good either. Something I look back at, uh, yeah, I'd answer the phone, but was it the correct way? I mean, how much more customers could I have gotten? You know, to your point, usually the best option is just find someone that's better than you at it. You find an office manager. Bingo. You, you said it phone. right. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So, um, my next question, this was actually on my last interview. I don't know if you know David James. I actually interviewed him um, and we left off with a question for the next interviewer, which was you. Uh, so I actually have a question for you and then I'll have you come up with a question as well for the next person. But his question was, um, how has your business provided you freedom and what were the benefits of that freedom? Ooh, that's a good one. Freedom. It's funny because, you know, we all start business and like you said, you know, you think it's this big freedom and it, it actually isn't. It takes, so it takes a bit, but as far as the freedom of like, there's, there's no one that can, no one I answer to really, you know, like I don't have, I show up for my team, but like that freedom of like, not someone, Jake, if you know, you didn't meet your quota or Jake, you didn't do this at work today or, you know, that, that type of freedom is gone because, you know, I'm in control. So that, that right there is pretty, prop, would probably be it. Just somebody hovering something above my head all the time that I'm not doing it mm. correctly or doing it right. So that that freedom of just getting away from that nine to five, looking forward to the weekend, um, you know, that's gone. I, like, I love it. All the days are the same for me. They're all Monday. We're all work. So, yeah, I think that's a problem a lot of people have, too, is they live for the weekend. So they're just trying to get through the week. But like the most successful business owners, usually they're living for Monday. They're excited for Monday to hit and they want every day to, day to be uh, just like Monday. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, of course, you get uh, burnt out sometimes, you know, especially in the spring rushes and stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, here in, you know, the Northeast, we have winter. So it's very mellow. It's very slow. You know, you get to remake your systems and breathe a little bit, and um, which is nice. And like, for example, we had this today. It's at what, 9 a.m.? Uh, I got up at six, you know, I went out to breakfast, like I had that leisure and that freedom to be able to do that, which was awesome. You know, the trucks are out. They left this morning at 3.30 a.m. 
to go all the way out to the New York area. I didn't have to do that. So that, yeah. that right there is just, it's a great feeling for sure. I didn't feel rushed. You know, I kind of got up at my, my will. And after this, I got a meeting and I'll go to the gym. I'll walk, do some cardio, come back, do some more spreadsheeting, getting stuff prepped for this year. And then I'll go work out tonight. So, you know, that that's freedom to me. Oh yeah. Yeah. A lot of people think of it as financial freedom, time freedom, but like just to your first point, just not having to report to someone, like being able to dictate what your day looks like is a massive freedom that um, as like, you really don't get it unless you're your own boss, unless you are, you are a business owner. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. But like I said, so the last question would be what, what should I ask my next interview as of right now? I don't know who the next one is, uh, but what would be a good question to ask them? It would be a good question to ask the next business owner, huh? All right. I'll make this like a little different. What, what would they do? You, you couldn't advertise on Google. How would they keep, how would they run their business? successfully without Google, make them think outside the box. Like for example, uh, make me think differently. So, so what, like, it's kind of a, just a weird question, but I'm just curious, what would you do without Google? How would your business run and operate and be successful and keep growing? That's a good question. It reminds me of a, another question that um, a mentor of mine asked me in the past, which was if you couldn't advertise your business at all, would you grow or would you go out of business? Would your referrals and, you know, just the networking and all these organic stuff would that push your business forward or would you die because you can't spend money to acquire new customers so i think google is probably like the biggest one of the biggest advertising platforms for most businesses so it's interesting to see how someone would answer that yeah i mean of course you can say you know you know you, i guess you could run facebook ads you got instagram you got tiktok you got youtube you got door knocking yard signs all this stuff but like would they do it you know, would they actually do it is the question. Like, would a lot of people have the answer, but would they, would they execute on it? And if they would, why don't they? Yeah. So what I'm trying to do this year, I guess I said that for myself is I'm doing all the stuff that we don't do to see what happens, you know, try to track it and, and see like we're doing uh flyers, which I've never done before postcards. Anybody who sends, spends over 10 grand with us, I'm going to give, send them a goodie bag. All these things that I've never done, I'm doing it. I want to really get our name out there because I grew this from handshakes, really. Mm. Now, now I'm like, you know what? I'm like, I, I want to jump on board with everybody else here and play the game. So I think I'm just opening the, the book. I, I was telling when I'm on page one still and I'm getting ready to flip it. So, yeah. But I mean, considering you haven't been doing too much marketing, you already grown as quickly and to the extent that you did. Um, once you're like super well rounded with your marketing and kind of firing on all cylinders, I mean, you're gonna smash through that two million dollar goal. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I think we were talking earlier. Uh, I don't have it right on me right now. Uh, I do actually. Our advertising, our advertising is only like two point six percent. That includes SEO. That includes PPC. Mm. And stuff. So, yeah. Well, cool. So um, that was all my questions for today. If anyone wants to learn a bit more about you, your business, maybe just connect with you, where could they find you online? Yeah, you could either, you just go right to my personal Facebook, Jake Benjamin, send me a message and uh, I'm glad to help anybody I can, man. Uh, this industry is awesome. It did me well. And, you know, I've got my first house, I ended up getting another and I'm under agreement now on another house. Uh, so this business is is awesome. And, you know, just just keep plugging away and you know, everything happens. Absolutely. Well, hey, man, you're crushing it. I really appreciate you hopping on today. Um, and yeah, thank you for the value provided. Awesome, bud. I'll talk to you soon. All right. You too. All right. Take so care.